Welcome everyone to this remarkable event. The title says something about Florida political history. This is remarkable because the arc of Florida's political history over the last, well, maybe 50 years, <laughs> these two individuals had been central to it. So like one of those law firm advertisements, it's almost 100 years of experience. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, and somewhere I see Senator Rod Smith. If you add Rod Smith and me, then you get to 200 years. <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, they've considerable experience. But the, the remarkable as individuals and, and historic uh, individual events, there's one event I would mention uh, about uh, Bob Graham. Bob Graham, of course, ran uh, for governor from Miami. And I believe Bob once said, it will be a cold day in hell when someone wins the governorship from Miami. And on the day he was sworn in in Tallahassee, it was snowing. <laughs> <clears throat> this is correct. And of course, Bill Nelson's remarkable event is very few of us have been have flown into space, <laughs> and Bill Nelson has. Uh, each of these gentlemen, Bill Nelson and Bob Graham, have served in the Senate. Uh, each have served in state government over decades uh, with uh, remarkable knowledge of the arc of history of the state of Florida. Uh, so I could not be more excited <laughs> about the opportunity to hear the, this discussion. They, they served as chairman in uh, US Senate committees, he served as chairman in Florida, served on the cabinet, served as governor, what else is there? So these are virtually the two most experienced people uh, in Florida politics uh, with honorable service over, over decades. And furthermore, they have both dedicated themselves to the University of Florida and knowledge and public knowledge. <clears throat> we all know the Graham Center, and the Graham Center exists and has existed for some time. And now we know the Nelson Initiative, uh, which has brought together, organized this event, organized an event where we discussed a bipartisanship, bipartisanship with uh, Senator Marco Rubio. So uh, we thank both of you for your dedication, not only to the state, but to the University of Florida. And thank you, Judy Russell, for uh, your fantastic organizational ability. And uh, thank you to uh, Grace Nelson and Adele Graham for your your history uh, as, as part of the state as well. So thank you and take it over. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, John. Just to give you uh, an idea of how all this started, I sent all of my papers to the university library system uh, and out of that, uh, this was spawned, that we have a series of discussions. Uh, and Dean Judy Russell is the one that said, I think there needs to be uh, some conversation about ethics. And thus was born uh, the Initiative on Ethics and Leadership, which is in collaboration with the Graham Center. And uh, as John mentioned, what he didn't mention, he's actually teaching a course at the law school that is a part of this initiative. And I've had the, the pleasure of being there and talking to his class. My daughter, who is a, a professor at Georgetown, has uh, done a similar uh, teaching at his class. And... Uh, I just asked John this morning, how's the class going? And he said the students are really into it on the question of leadership and ethics. 
So thank you, Dean Judy Russell, for coming up with this idea. John mentioned that we had uh, Marco Rubio here, and that was to give everybody a flavor of how did a Republican senator and a Democratic one, how did they get along in this toxic atmosphere? That was uh, one of our conversations. We had the historian John Meacham, who has written a lot about this subject from the historical perspective there. Next month, at the end of the month, the 31st, I'm bringing uh, an anthropologist from USF, who is the lady that discovered all of the graves, unknown graves, unknown deaths, at the Mariana Boys School uh, that back in the old days we used to refer to as uh, the Reform School at Mariana. Uh, and. Uh, and she's going to tell this extraordinary story about how the state of Florida and the county of Jackson and the city of Mariana resisted any trying to discover. And as a result, she has discovered some 25 or 30 graves and have identified them. Then in uh, April, I'm bringing 10 astronauts here. And Judy and I are having so many requests for their time up here, we're trying to figure out how to get them parceled out on various events on the day that they're going to be here. But one of my favorites is to sit with my colleague, and the two of us just discuss, as John introduced, some of Florida political history that the two of us have been privileged to be a part of. So, Bob, I'd like to start out, and people want to know, how did you and I get into politics? What was it that propelled us to do that? So uh, take us back when you were a, a young one in Miami and, and tell us. Well, it started with a mistake that my mother and father made. <laughs> my uh, father was a uh, mining engineer, uh, had run a small gold mine in the Black Hills of South Dakota when he was uh, persuaded, probably on a cold day in February, to come to Florida to set up a sugarcane plantation. Uh, Sadly, his first wife, with uh, three children, uh, died shortly after they came to Florida. Uh, several years later, my dad, uh, by accident, met my mother, and uh, they fell in love and decided to get married with the understanding that they would not have any children, but rather my mother would raise the three children that dad already had. That uh, promise lasted a little less than 30 days. Uh, my uh, parents were married in January and I was born on the 9th of November of 1936. At the same time that uh, I was gestating, uh, my father was running for the Florida State Senate, the first time he'd ever uh, engaged in elective politics, and uh, he was elected. So my mother said that the answer to your question uh, is a, a womb affliction, that, I, that she had a womb affliction for politics, having gone to so many events for my father, and that I picked up that seed while I was still uh, resting in her tummy. Uh, but I did grow up in a political family, uh, politics, as well as what transitioned from sugar into the dairy business were our main activities. And um, it was an exciting um, run. And I, until this morning, I didn't think of myself as having passed into history 
but uh, I guess I have, so, and I'm glad to be here. Well, uh, in those early days, I was actually in Miami as an Army lieutenant, and I remember seeing the young state representative, Bob Graham. So you were elected in the 60s, uh, and then elected to the state senate, and then, of course, in 78, that was the time that you ran for governor. I, we'll get into that uh, uh, election, but what, uh, what was the first opportunity that you saw that there was a, a legislative seat that you wanted to jump into? Uh, 1966. Uh, that was in the beginning of one of the major political transitions in Florida, uh, and that was reapportionment. Before the mid-60s, Florida was the most malapportioned legislature in the country. That is, the fewest number of people could elect a majority of the two houses of the state legislature. The essential formula, for instance, in the House of Representatives, was that every one of the 67 counties had at least one member of the State House of Representatives. If you had more than the minimal amount, you got two. And if you were a really big county, like a Hillsborough or a Duval or a Dade, you got three. Uh, that was the extent of the malapportionment. So when it hit uh, Florida, uh, it was with tremendous impact. Dade County had had three members of the State House, and after the 1966 reapportionment plan was finally approved, we had, I think, 30 members of the House. So it was a tr uh, tremendous uh, change and uh, brought into the uh, legislature a lot of younger people uh, and some very able people, and a few who hadn't even attended the University of Florida. Uh, 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 and it was a very exciting uh, time. Claude Kirk had just been elected governor. Uh, we were writing a new state constitution, uh, dealing with some issues that had been uh, put to the side for many years. Uh, it, it was a wonderful way to start your political career. So uh, Bob has described the legislature pre-reapportionment when the pork chop gang uh, up in the panhandle basically ruled the day. And they were uh, the, the barons. And there was one that was actually named Baron, and his name was Senator Dempsey Barron. And I'm telling you, he held court, and he assumed it was going to be his way. Uh, he had a sign on his desk when you came in to see him, and it says, assume nothing. And that was kind of his modus operandi. Uh, when that reapportionment occurred, uh, you brought in all these bright new stars, yourself, uh, Dick Pettigrew, uh, Marshall Harris, uh, uh, Buddy McKay, uh, all of these up-and-comers. And some refer to the late 60s as the golden age of the Florida legislature. Any comments on that? I think it deserved that uh, title because there were so many ideas that had been uh, frustrated uh, during the 40s and 50s and uh, were wa waiting for the right climate in Tallahassee to be seriously considered. And so that there was a surge of uh, legislative activity in education, in health care, in transportation across the board. Uh, it also was the beginning of uh, more partisanship uh, in the legislature. Uh, th those pre-reapportionment 
legislatures were almost all Democrat. Uh, in, in the mid-60s, places like Broward County, Fort Lauderdale, started to elect Republicans, and that number uh, has increased. I, the first Democratic caucus of members of the House that I attended uh, in the fall of 1966, uh, one of the senior members uh, gave a speech, and the speech was around the fact that we had, for the first time, a noticeable number of Republicans, and that they were causing difficulties. They were, uh, they were raising points of order and uh, parliamentary uh, maneuvers to try to uh, shape whatever the piece of legislation was. And that what we Democrats ought to do for the good of Florida was in 1968 to have an organized effort to defeat uh, these Republicans. Uh, I, uh, uh, I got up and uh, said, no, I think that's a bad idea. He says, every day we come to the legislature, the parking lot is filled with school buses, which have brought school children from around the state, to, from their hometowns here to Tallahassee to see their legislature uh, in operation. And that uh, uh, it is the first time that most of these school children have ever seen a Republican is when they come uh, and the Republicans are pointed out uh, to them so that they will see what one looks like. Uh, uh, and that uh, I don't want us to eliminate that possibility for the school children of Florida. Uh, the second group won out. Now think back to that time. That was coming out of when there was the Solid South, and the Solid South was all Democrat. Uh, that was in large part as a, a reaction to decades earlier uh, the Civil War, uh, Reconstruction, and so forth. Uh, but right about the time, the inflection point is the late 60s, the reapportionment. I come along a few years later in the class of 72, quite uh, half of my delegation from Brevard and Orange County uh, was Republican, if not more. And uh, the Republicans and the Democrats all got along with each other. Although there was a Republican leader in the House and he would get up and give his protestations, uh, and if there was a vote, uh, his position usually would not win. But when it came time to get things done, the two sides would uh, work together and were all personal friends. This was also a time in the legislature when if you had small children all the members came and lived for two months of the session with their children and the children went to school if they were of school age in the Leon County schools. Our particular situation where our children were quite young we were in and out of each other's apartments and the children in and out of the apartments. Uh, we had uh, next door to us Andrew Crenshaw who went on to be the Republican president of the Senate. Uh, it was that kind of thing. Uh, you don't see that a lot today. So part of understanding Florida political history is to contrast it with what's going on now where what's going on now in Tallahassee is very much like what you see going on in Washington. It's a rigid party and often ideological system. Let's go back to when you first ran. Uh, did you have any particular uh, way of campaigning? 
uh, any particular thing that stands out to you as to how you, as an unknown, connected with the voters? Well, the main thing is you wanted to avoid being trampled on. Uh, I said that there were almost 30 members of the Dade County House delegation after reapportionment. Uh, if there were five people running for uh, each of those uh, positions, it was a bunch of people uh, running, and you, uh, you were in serious danger of being trampled uh, on. Uh, but uh, the, um, the main difference, I think, was that uh, uh, almost every one of those 100-plus people were neophytes. And uh, so you had a lot of uh, fresh people and fresh ideas. It was a, an exciting time to be in Florida politics. And I don't know how many of you were here when Claude Kirk was the governor, but he, if it wasn't interesting enough from the, the people who worked in the uh, state house uh, in uh, Tallahassee, uh, the governor's mansion made it uh, interesting. And, uh, and uh, this particular era, uh, that Bob served, out of the state senate came a young state senator from Pensacola who decides to take on a big field of Democrats. And when Reuben Askew won the Democratic runoff, that's when we had a runoff, uh, he's the one that was able to take out Claude Kirk the first Republican governor since Reconstruction, and Claude Kirk uh, was typically uh, anti-tax, and Reuben Askew's platform is a tax on corporations. Uh, what stood out in that election of 1970 to you that propelled Askew into the governorship? Well, the while taxes was in the background, the real issue was education. Uh, Florida uh, public schools and its universities, the word mediocre would be a compliment to, uh, to add. And I'm a graduate of both of those levels. Uh, Askew was elected on a platform of substantially elevating the quality of education uh, at all levels in Florida, and it was going to cost money to do that. And I think it was a referendum uh, on places like the University of Florida as much as a referendum on Reuben Askew or any other individual politician, and uh, education won. And we are the beneficiaries today of some of those decisions that started back in the uh, 60s and 70s. 1970 was also the time that Lawton Childs surprised everybody in the state, being way behind a field of Democrats, and had the idea of walking from Century, Florida, which is just beyond uh, Pensacola, uh, at the Alabama line, and walking the whole state. And of course, as it went into the first primary and Lawton was able to come in second, then he had such momentum and this idea had captivated people uh, that uh, he then had a fairly easily, easy victory in uh, November. So that's the setting. I go to uh, help out Reuben Askew in Tallahassee. I'm uh, an unpaid uh, uh, assistant. Uh, flew up there uh, every week to Tallahassee and uh, just did what I could do to help him in the governor's office. Uh, and uh, along comes 1972. My county is, Brevard County is a Republican county. 
It has uh, three quarters of the legislative delegation are all Republican, and a seat opens. And Grace and I have just come home from our honeymoon. And the two of us start campaigning. Uh, and we had a, it was a multi-member district. Now you only have single-member districts. This was a multi-member district. And it included all of Brevard County and half of Orange County. And Grace and I started going door to door. Uh, that is one of the best experiences in life that I've ever had. Uh, and I was scared to death because I knew that Richard Nixon was running for re-election, was going to be on the top of the ticket, and so was George McGovern. And I knew that Brevard County was not going to be going for George McGovern. And so we really went to it. Brand new bride, full of a messianic mission as she approached every front door to get that household to vote for her husband. I had already separated from Grace knocking on doors because she was go so good I was just wasting her time. So I put Grace on the other side of the street and we'd go down opposite sides of the street and she was very effective. So one day she gets to this house she can't get to the front door because the sprinklers are on. But the garage door is open. So she marches into the garage, into the back door, rings the doorbell, only it's not the doorbell. It's the automatic garage door closer. <laughs> she races back to the garage door. It's too late. Now she's in a totally dark garage and hoping that she can make her way back to the inside door and just hoping somebody's home. Bangs on the door. Sure enough, the gentleman's of the house is there. He opens his door. There's Grace in his dark garage, and she doesn't know what to say except, sir, will you vote for my husband? <laughs> <laughs> and we covered a lot of neighborhoods that way. And uh, happily, I'll tell you the results of the November 72 election in that legislative district. Uh, Richard Nixon had 75%, and yours truly got 75%. Yeah. So, yeah. Because of her. Uh, so, Bob, now you're becoming this distinguished statesman, uh, in the House, you run for the Senate, you're in the Senate. What made you think that as a young state senator that with an attorney general, Bob Shevin, also from Miami, that was going to be in the race, what made you think that you were going to be able to have a chance to win? Well, race is a deserves her name that describes uh, her. Uh, uh, but let me say, Adele ain't bad at that either. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I felt that uh, the time had arrived when this old adage, and it wasn't for me, it was the political writer of the Miami Herald, a man named Alan Morris, who after my father ran and was defeated for governor in 1944, said it'll be a cold day in hell when anybody from Dade County is elected governor. In spite of that prophecy, I was optimistic uh, that uh, we uh, could be successful. Uh, I also had an unexpected but very significant thing occur, uh, and that is I had been the chairman of the uh, House Education Committee, and in the course of that 
we had held many of our hearings in schools and I'd had a chance to spend some time with teachers and students and had come up with a list of things that I thought needed to be uh, dealt with, transformed. I ended up giving a speech to a group of civics teachers about my list of educational reforms for Florida. And at the end of my speech, when I thought I would have boisterous applause, uh, it was quiet snickering, as if this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Uh, and one of the teachers said, the only way to find out uh, what's go really going on in school is to come there for a long enough period of time uh, to become fully aware and absorb uh, the, uh, uh, the occurrences at the school. So I said in a typical politician's manner that if she could work out the details, I would be glad to do that. She called back a couple of days later and said, Bob, I have worked it out. And I said, what, what have you done? He said, well, I've made arrangements for you to come to Carroll City Senior High School, a large, predominantly African-American high school in North Dade County uh, on the day after Labor Day, report to room 207, and you will be teaching 12th grade civics for the next 16 weeks. Uh, well, that was a little more than I had quite bargained for, but I thought I made a commitment, I'm going to do it. So I uh, uh, taught those 16 weeks uh, and taught a curriculum that I had developed with a regular teacher at Carroll City called What Every Citizen Needs to Know to make democracy work for them. And it was a wonderful, life-transforming experience. And afterwards, I had sort of a, uh, a, a session with myself, analogous to the one you described with Lawton Child. And I didn't, uh, I knew I couldn't walk. He had already taken that one. but. Uh, Maybe I could take different jobs similar to the one I had at Carroll City, except for one day, not 16 weeks. Uh, and I started doing that, and I think that was a critical part of my connecting with the people of Florida. And, and like if, if you've never uh, seen the pictures or seen the TV commercials of Bob in the 78 campaign for governor in his work days, that was his campaign. And he'd be in a, 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 a blue collar uh, uniform doing some manual labor that was very appealing from a standpoint that here's a guy for us. This is a guy for the, the little person uh, this is someone that understands the basics of humanity. He'd be cutting a log uh, at a sawmill, or he'd be in a classroom teaching, or uh, so many of those. And that caught on like wildfire for the most well-known of all the candidates, the sitting attorney general, Bob Shevin, and all of a sudden, first primary, Shevin is first, and you're second. Is that right? That's right. Okay, and so you, like Lawton Childs, eight years before, had that momentum going into the runoff primary. And so how, what was the final result in the Democratic primary? I don't know what the numbers were, but I knew we, went, we won. Uh, he the, won handling. Yeah. Uh, and it was, as I say, it was a really a life-transforming experience, and it had a 
tremendous uh, assistance to me uh, as governor. Uh, as an example, one of my jobs was driving a cement truck. Those are the trucks that have the big wheel that rolls around. And uh, I, uh, that was my first job as a commercial truck driver. And you have to get, uh, this is at, in the 1970s, a special li license to be able to do that. Uh, and the, to get the license, you have to take a 20-question true-false test. Well, I was able to pass the test, got my license, was assigned to a truck in Palm Beach County that I was going to spend the next eight hours delivering concrete to different construction sites. Had absolutely no, no business driving that damn truck. Uh, and while I was driving it, I said, there's got to be a better way than this to determine who's competent to drive these specialized trucks. And uh, uh, I came up with the idea of a classified commercial driver's license where you would have to demonstrate by actually putting your hands on the wheel that you knew how to drive the specific type of truck that you were going, going to drive. And you did that as governor. The legislature passed that, and that's the law of Florida today. Well, uh, it was, uh, again, an idea that caught on like wildfire and uh, propelled this young state senator then into the Democratic nomination. And your opponent was quite wealthy, wasn't he? Uh, Jack Eckerd? He was... He was not looking for his next social security check. Yeah. Um, just to tie in here, as our lives have been inextricably intertwined uh, over the years, so in 1978, the very popular Republican congressman from Central Florida, Lou Fry, decides to run for governor. But he is beaten by Jack Eckerd in the Republican primary. But that opened up the congressional seat for this member of the state legislature. And in the process, we got a surprise because uh, all of a sudden, entering into the race is none other than the former occupant of that congressional seat, U.S. Senator Ed Gurney. And so you can imagine that when he got into the race, people thought that I was dead meat, and uh, we just revved it up, and you talk about knocking on doors, uh, all over Orange County and Brevard County. It was still catching on. Uh, but we did something different. Early on, we had two-lane causeways across the Indian River. And I would get out there uh, at uh, a particular hour of rush hour. And on one direction of traffic, I could stand by the road with my sign that said, Hi, I'm Bill Nelson for Congress. And I could wave, and I could look them straight in the eye, and I could have a personal encounter. And so we graduated from that to the street corners. And I'll never forget, I was petrified going to the big city of Orlando for the first time because uh, they were sophisticated. I was this little country boy. And I went to the corner of Colonial and Bumby where I could stand on the corner and as the light changed, I could move on the corner so that I could still have that personal interaction of locking eyes with the driver waving with my sign and say, good afternoon, ma'am, good afternoon, sir. And it, I, 
the first time I walked to the intersection, I, I was literally shaking, thinking they're going to think this is hokey. And a construction truck of young construction workers passed by, and they started honking and waving, and I knew that that was going to catch on. And so while Bob is governor, I am now in the U.S. House of Representatives. While he is there, he is doing wonderfully progressive and far-reaching things, such as he starts the process of the restoration of the Everglades. He starts... Uh, in that process, whereas the diking and draining uh, had been occurring for a half century, reversing the water flow of Mother Nature, and what Bob does is uh, they had taken the meandering stream of the Kissimmee River with all the oxbows and the cleansing grasses so that by the time the water got to Lake Okeechobee, it had all been cleansed and they made it a straight ditch. And Bob starts the process of reversing that. And today we have half of the Kissimmee River restored as a result of this governor. What do you remember about that? Well, let me just pause a moment. Uh, Bill has been uh, asking all the questions. Uh, and I've been trying to provide some answers. This, let me just disabuse you. If you think that this is some amateur uh, who just st staggered into that uh, bridge uh, waving his, uh, his sign, I first came to know Bill Nelson uh, back in the uh, 60s when he was in high school and was the international president of the Key Club, which was a Kiwanis Civic Club sponsored high school leadership organization. Uh, you don't get to be the international president of the Key Club by being an amateur. Uh, he wasn't then, and he, and he brings all that talent now here at the University of Florida. Thank you, Bill. Uh, you're kind, thank you. So let's go to some of the highlights. Uh, restoration of the, uh, of the Everglades, taking your knowledge of uh, education and forming a board of regents, uh, trying to have some governance in the state university system that would allow academic freedom. Uh, the setting up of the appointment of judges. Years later, uh, he goes to Washington. He sets up the appointment of federal judges, again, in a process whereby he and the other senator would appoint members of the community that would sit on a board and they would do the interview of the applicants for U.S. judge, just like he had done years before in the applications for state judges. And it would take the politics out of the selection of a lifetime position of U.S. judges. I'm happy to say that when I joined him in the Senate and continued that process and my colleagues, Mel Martinez and Marco Rubio uh, continued that, and unfortunately, that process has stopped. Uh, and yet, this all came from this governor and what he had done in reforming the way things. And, and one other thing I want to tell you about, since we're in the university community, years later, Bob is still now the senior senator, and at the state level, they suddenly abolish the Board of Regents, the governing, so that it can become much more political in the appointments of the various boards 
that would oversee the universities. What did he do as a private citizen after he had retired from the Senate? He went out and organized a constitutional amendment, state constitution that passed overwhelmingly, setting up a board of governors and boards of trustees for each of the universities, trying to get back to that bipartisanship that he had been so successful at as governor and then as senator. You remember all that? I have a faint recollection of that, yes. <laughs> well, my, uh, my fundamental belief was that the success of a university which wants to be uh, and justifies being thought of as one of the leading intellectual institutions in America, you can't have that and have a highly politicalized uh, governance system for the universities. Uh, the best illustration of that was what happened to Florida during that short period of time when we didn't have a strong central board. There had not been a new medical school established anywhere in the United States of America in over 20 years. Uh, in that brief period of about two or three years, Florida established three new medical schools. Uh, you can't tell me that there wasn't a little bit of parochial politics being played there. Uh, and if that system had continued, uh, we would have had a, a very uh, unimpressive system where units of uh, educational uh, governance were distributed based on political influence in, in the legislature, not on some kind of a rational plan of what was in the best interest of the state. So that was what motivated me. and about 75% of the people of Florida to say, we don't want that degree of politicalization of uh, higher education. And thus, today, we're sitting in the seventh most distinguished public university in the United States of America. As um, Bob is talking, I'm just thinking of ramifications of the policies that he put in. So he sets this much more rational way of making educational decisions uh, that emanate from this uh, board of uh, regents. And uh, back in the old days, the operative policy of the Veterans Administration was that, say for the legacy veterans hospitals, there was one in Lake City, uh, there was one in Gainesville, uh, I think there was one in Miami, but the operative policy is that they would not put a veterans hospital unless there was a medical school located in the same uh, location. And as a result of him having a more rational policy, for example, of where the medical schools should go, that allowed then the Veterans Administration until 10 years ago to, uh, that adhered to that policy, they weren't putting the veterans uh, hospitals where all the veterans population was. So all kinds of consequences that come out of good governmental policy. So, Bob, your easily elected uh, uh, United States Senator, although it got close between you and Paula Hawkins, got close a few weeks out, but then you had an easy victory, uh, and uh, of course had no really uh, challenge for the rest of the time. Why in 2004, when I was begging you not to retire, 
Why did you retire? Well, uh, I was uh, almost uh, 80 years old. Uh, I was almost 80 years old. I would be uh, in uh, 2006. Uh, I had been there for, uh, would be 18 years. Uh, I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do to, for my happiness, but particularly for the happiness of my wonderful wife who had tolerated me for all those years uh, and our children. And uh, it just seemed like it was the time to, uh, to move on to the next period of life. And I enjoyed that. And, of course, that next period of his life, uh, we've been discussing some of it, and part of it you're seeing live right here, what has been the contributions to this state by the Graham Center. Uh, and uh, the contributions will just keep coming on and on of public service. I find that similarly, uh, that uh, the opportunity to, to do this and to interact with folks of this quality and other guests uh, has been helpful. The opportunity to get back into the classroom and interact with a different generation, try to understand that generation, try to understand the application of new technology. Uh, campaigns today are totally different from the way they were when the two of us got into it. Because now there's a lot that you can't see through social media and that you can't see because of the abomination of the campaign finance rules so that so much money is hidden uh, that is uh, influencing the political process and doubly so now, money that's hidden and then is going to social media that you can't uh, track that and you don't know the influence that it's having and you're going to see that in living color in this presidential election this year. Uh, the influence of social media uh, and not even to speak of now foreign actors playing a part of our elections in a direct way that is often under the radar and but for the intelligence services picking it up. Now, speaking of intelligence, Bob was chairman of the Intelligence Committee. Bob wrote uh, a book after his Senate career, Intelligence Matters. You want to share some of the ideas there? Uh, yes, but uh, Bill, I noticed that you are uh, cleverly keeping all the questions for you and the answers for me, and that's, that's going to change. We've got, uh, minutes, 10, we've got 10, 15 minutes yet to go. Uh, Intelligence Matters was, uh, is a book about my experience as chairman of the uh, Intelligence Committee during the period immediately after 9-11 and some of the, uh, somewhat like my early experiences with education, I saw some uh, defects in our intelligence agencies and made a series of recommendations, some of which were adopted, some, some not. Uh, but then out of that uh, came a novel called Keys to the Kingdom, which was about which was the things that were censured out of the nonfiction book uh, I put in the novel uh, and uh, uh, it uh, has uh, stood up quite well, I think. Uh, but Bill, let me ask you a question. You, you're known for a lot of things. Probably the thing most people uh, think of you as having been heavily involved with uh, is our space program. That was a, 
a logical area given where you came from. You came from the uh, center of the space uh, activities in Florida. Uh, what's your current assessment of the uh, space program? What are going to be the, uh, the challenges uh, over the, the next 10 years uh, or so? Up until 2010, we had a government space program. And so I got together with a Republican senator, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, of Texas. Uh, she and I would alternate as chairman of the Space and Science Subcommittee of the Commerce Committee, whichever one was the majority. And uh, we wrote a bill that set NASA on a different course that the space program was going to be a commercial space program and a government space program. And that the government space program, primarily NASA, the Air Force, uh, would assist the commercial space program to get off the ground. And that ultimately, this dual track, we would leave to low Earth orbit, the orbit of 250 to 350 uh, miles above the Earth, where the International Space Station is right now with six human beings on board doing research, that we would leave that sphere to the commercial space industry and that NASA would go and further explore the heavens, not only with the unmanned program, which has been extraordinary, uh, but also the manned program and at this point, the manned program, as announced by President Obama, the goal is Mars in the decade of the 2030s. Uh, the Trump administration has announced that it would be to Mars by way of the moon. And as it is turning out, the commercial space program will assist in that so that the government is not bearing all of the expenses. And as we've seen with Elon Musk and with Jeff Bezos uh, and all these little startups, uh, there's a, a little one called Relativity Space that is doing 3D printing of a rocket that is going to launch in another year. And of course, when you can do that and simplify the rocket, it brings the cost of getting into space way down. These are the activities that are going now as we get ready uh, to relaunch Americans on American rockets, which will occur later this year. What, what impact do you think uh, this new generation of space programs will have on Florida? Well, already we know that one of the byproducts of the space program is the ability to observe things from space and have pictures from space uh, that otherwise we wouldn't have. And so much of the measurement of the atmosphere and the climate has been instructive to us with regard to climate change. And from instruments on orbit in satellites, spacecraft can measure these various uh, things that we take for granted. Your weather report, you take for granted. We take for granted now on an approaching hurricane that we're going to have a fairly accurate prognostication of where and how intense that hurricane is going to be. Uh, and a combination of the space program and then the on-ground scientists and then the NASA and Air Force planes that are flying in the air, NOAA, all of these things coming together, uh, our technology is revolutionizing. Uh, our lifestyles. So as we uh, wrap this up, as you look back, 
Bob, uh, I'm sure you feel as I do that public service is one of the highest callings that a person could have. You and I were raised in an era in which uh, we were taught that public service is a noble calling. But the public at large doesn't feel that right now. Uh, there's a lot of cynicism. What do you think it's going to take to get out of this, uh, this malaise about public service that we see in many pockets of America today? The most fundamental thing that's going to be required is uh, our people who are elected and have the responsibility, accepting that responsibility uh, and uh, acting uh, in a way that will serve the broad public interest. Uh, as an example, uh, if you've uh, had an opportunity to travel uh, outside the United States, one of the things that strikes you is how much better the infrastructure, the roads, the highways, the uh, uh, airports in other countries than they are in the United States. Uh, th that's an area that we have always sort of taken for granted that the United States will be the leader in. I think we're going to need some people elected to office who when they say we're going to make a significant investment in modernizing our infrastructure, once they get elected, that won't just be a, a false promise, but will be a real personal commitment. Uh, we've done it before, we can do it again. Uh, we, we need to insist that our elected officials prioritize the things that we as the voters think are the most important and hold them to account. When the two of us were in the Senate together, remember, uh, we in a bipartisan way would get a highway bill. And the highway bill would uh, provide the authorization for the money and then the appropriations committee would come along and it'd be an overwhelming vote. 90 plus senators would be voting for it. And yet, you can't even get a highway bill to come up with over $3 trillion of infrastructure needs that are desperately wanting right now in this country. Yeah. So I'd say number one is hold the people who have accepted the responsibility of public service to what they committed to do while they were still candidates. Second, uh, at a earlier po point in time, return civics to the curriculum of our public schools where it had disappeared for better part of a decade uh, and uh, at our universities. I'm very proud of the the Graham Center for Public Service and our director, uh, Matt Jacobs, Dr. right there. Dr. Matt Jacobs is with us today. That's our whole reason for being, uh, is to encourage a next generation of University of Florida students to understand uh, how the governmental process works and how they can be effective within that uh, process. So those are some of the, I think, two most uh, important steps uh, to uh, begin the process of restoration of public confidence in their elected officials. And all of this is taking place, what Bob says needs to be done, in an extremely difficult time to communicate. Uh, this morning it was announced that McClatchy newspapers have gone bust. Does that mean that the Miami Herald is going to be shut down? Uh, we've seen other newspapers that are still in existence, local newspapers, we've seen that they're nothing but a shadow of their former selves. 
So where does that communication come from? And that's one of the new challenges with the technology that we have, not only directly from your favorite cable television channel, but also by means of being delivered by the internet and social media. And so, needless to say, this political era of Florida political history live, uh, we've got the challenges of what Bob has outlined that are going to be challenges for every one of us, and especially for those young people out there. So I want to thank you all for coming and let Bob and me reminisce and uh, tell you a l little bit of slice of Florida political history. And I want to turn the mic over to Judy, and you can dismiss us with whatever instructions you would like. Are you willing to take a few questions from the audience before we dismiss? Okay. So I think we have some folks with mics. So if you put your hand up, yeah, somebody will bring a mic to you. And uh, I think it would be great to get some questions. Uh, thank you very much, Senators. Uh, it's an incredible honor for me to be here with you. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, despite this maybe not being the main area of your focus in, during this, your time in the Senate, how should the U.S. address the meteoric rise of China, bo uh, both in the political and economic international stages going into the next future decades? Uh, uh, you're a student here. Uh, what year? Good. Are you a political science major? No, history. Okay. Uh, the question is, how do we address the, uh, the challenge of China? The strategy of the United States over several years was to keep China basically contained to that region of the world. We built a United States military uh, that would uh, uh, be dominant, but uh, still keeping China with their influence in that realm. That policy has started to be chipped away. Uh, in the first place, the, uh, the lack of passage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement allows China to get in the door first with a number of those nations uh, instead of the United States as an economic trader. The military projection, China is obviously flexing its muscles. And so they are directly challenging the region, going out little sand spit of islands and suddenly occupying them and putting long runways on them so that they can further project their power in all that region of the world down toward the Philippines. Uh, and so we're going to have China continue to flex its muscles. It obviously flexes its muscles economically, and they don't play fair because they will cheat. Uh, and if they don't cheat on a specific trade agreement, they will write whatever that business deal, it's going to be at least half, if not more, Chinese. And if they keep that agreement, by the way, they will use their ability to snoop, and they will continue to steal our intellectual property. Now, I, it sounds like I'm being pretty hard on China, but it's the truth. And so let's state what the truth is. Uh, 
Any comment from you? Bill, I agree with most of what you said. In terms of what should be our objective, let's say 25 or 50 years from now, uh, and for the Chinese, that's almost the blink of an eye in terms of spatial decision making. Uh, I think we ought to try to be developing a relationship that is going to be competitive, but doesn't have to be combative uh, with the Chinese. And I think one of the best places to start that uh, are on campuses as we are sitting this morning. Uh, if we can start to develop personal relationship between uh, our adolescents, uh, under college undergraduates, and their counterparts from China in both locations, U.S. institutions and Chinese institutions. I think over a, a generation or two, we can develop a, a new, different, and more constructive relationship with, uh, with China. Uh, and I think the whole world will be the beneficiary uh, of that. That. Okay, I don't want to wear out our welcome because we're past our hour, but we've got several uh, questions here, so please, uh, let's get the lady right here. Oh, you've already got the mic. Go ahead. <laughs> Good morning. Um, with Governor DeSantis's reported moderation, um, get it on, closer to your mouth. With Governor DeSantis's reported moderation on issues like the environment or education, perhaps even progressivism, what is your assessment on Governor Ron DeSantis and um, his administration thus far? And does he speak to this bipartisanship that you both have so spoken to today? I'll, I'll say that uh, I think the first uh, year plus of Governor DeSantis' administration uh, has been surprising. He has been more moderate than I thought uh, he would be uh, and has gotten the benefit uh, of that. Uh, there will be a lot of decisions made in the next 45 days that will determine whether the, the indications from his first legislative session has carried over into the second. I'm hopeful that it will. Uh, Florida's state, because of its tremendous growth, almost a thousand new residents every day, uh, has equivalent challenges. And we frankly don't have the, the time to spend on partisan squabbling. We ought to be spending it figuring out what's the best answer to deal with things like our uh, infrastructure, like the future of our educational institutions, uh, and seeing that there are the resources to do what is necessary to serve the interest of our people. All right, let's get the lady right here. Thank you. Thank you for your service to our state and country. Uh, my question is regarding preemption and with the current political climate we're seeing, while I agree that you know, many issues should be dealt with at the regional or state level, things like environmental protections and conservation, we're now seeing that with all of the preemptions, issues around things like affordable housing and climate change legislation are really being challenged uh, at the local level when we try to put forward um, local policies that would help to protect our communities and provide for those people that we're supposed to be upholding and, and serving as uh, public figures. So I wonder if you could talk to the issue of sort of state versus home rule. Well, I, uh, I may be a little old-fashioned, but I believe that the best form of government tends to be the one that is closest to the people. And that's particularly true in a state like Florida, 
uh, the differences in the character of the challenges facing government, let's say, in Walton County in the Panhandle, uh, as opposed to Lee County in southwest Florida, are enormously different and are going to require the ability of that of the local governments to develop policies that are specifically appropriate for that section of Florida. So I'm, I am, as a general proposition, in favor of giving local governments the latitude to be creative in developing the best solutions for their people to their particular set of problems. I heartily agree until it becomes ideological or partisan. Uh, and then you have to, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, and I'll take you way back to 1975. I'm this young legislator. And Florida was experiencing this enormous growth. And yet, uh, the attitude was uh, there was no coherence. There needed to be some planning for that growth. I had seen that in my own county. The advent of the space age when we were trying to catch up with the Soviet Union. People are pouring into Brevard County. They don't have any place uh, to sleep. They're sleeping in their cars. The whole idea was to get the construction up without thoughts about uh, planning the roads and the drainage and so forth and so on. And so uh, years later, uh, in 75, the task fell to me to try to convince the Florida legislature that to plan f ahead was not to be communistic that it was in our best interest. And, and thus we passed the Local Government Comprehensive Planning Act of 1975, which became the forerunner to 1985, the Growth Management Act, and so forth. An act, by the way, that stood the test of time and has been dismantled over the last several years. So. Uh, Bob's absolutely right. I always loved whenever the delegations from the cities and the counties would come to Washington, I would always make time for them because I wanted to learn from them what are their needs and would defer to their judgment uh, for their local interest unless it ran into this other roadblock that I just described. Okay, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. General, th thank you again for doing this. This is, this is outstanding. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, some of Florida's environmental challenges that uh, you've addressed. Uh, it, it seems like over the course of the past few years that, that all this hard work and acts of Congress, actually, are being dismantled piecemeal. Uh, what comes across is by the executive branch, but I'd like to get your take on, on how all these challenges that we've already crossed the bridge are now being dismantled. And I've always said Bob Graham's the best governor we've had in my lifetime. Amen to that. So what specific dismantling do you want us to address? Say again? Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll start on this, but he was one of the pioneers. Uh, I think, uh, I can't remember the year in which the Clean Water Act was enacted. Wasn't it in the 80s? Maybe earlier than that. Uh, I was in the House at the time. I remember that. Uh, and, uh, of course, it was done bipartisan. It might have been under Nixon. All the way back to Johnson. So it operates on a basic premise. To sustain life, you need clean air and clean water. And uh, that's the whole premise of the legislation. 
That's the premise on us trying to get a grip on everything that we're putting up into the, uh, particularly carbon dioxide and methane, up into the upper atmosphere that's creating the greenhouse effect. Um, but there has been this mentality that if it's a governmental regulation, we want to get rid of it for the advantage of somebody who wants to take advantage of that particular resource. And that is ultimately destructive to our planet. I might just say that because I make a statement like that and all of a sudden my mind's eye goes back to the window of a spacecraft looking back at Earth uh, orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, and it is so beautiful, and yet it looks so fragile. And you can even see with the naked eye uh, the changes. Now, this is back 30-plus years ago, uh, and I'm coming across the Amazon, and I can see the color contrast below of the destruction of the rainforest, and then I can look to the mouth of the Amazon in the same window, and I see the silt discoloring the Atlantic for hundreds of miles, coming across Madagascar. Back then, they had cut down all the trees in Madagascar in 1986. And you could obviously see the result of that, because at the mouth of the rivers in the brilliant blue waters of the Indian Ocean is this silt that comes out because there's no vegetation to hold the topsoil when the rains come. So we've got to hang on to our clean air and clean water. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a city commissioner, Helen Warren, and we recently made a proclamation that we're in a climate emergency. And with all the points that you have just made, I'm wondering if that isn't the unifying conversation that every country, every business should be having. And at our university systems, every classroom should be looking at what is their involvement in the future that's going to impact climate change, that it's a unifying thing. Again, we, we are going to be a point of migration that already we're seeing people moving here in the state of Florida. So what policies do you see? And you know, maybe we need every politician to go up in space uh, to appreciate that position. Some I of them ought to go on a one-way trip. Well. <laughs> okay. Let, can we decide, can we decide who falls into which category? Uh, I, I want to hear your perspective, but I, I want to say that this morning, also on the news, I heard something astounding. I heard that Lindsey Graham said we better pay attention to climate change. Uh, that is not the way Lind Lindsey has behaved in the past 18 years that I was in the Senate. Uh, and, uh, and yet, if that is telling us something, it would almost be like, you remember the quest to keep drilling off the coast of Florida? Bob and I, as senators, have a meeting with Dick Cheney as vice president. And Dick Cheney, who called the meeting, says, I'm concerned about you. Uh, we need to open up the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And basically, very politely, the two of us uh, uh, explained that as long as we were around that that was not going to happen because first of all there wasn't much oil out there most of the oil was where the Lord sent all of the nutrients down the Mississippi and it was compacted into the earth's crust uh, south of Louisiana uh, but uh, also because we had a tourism industry and oh by the way we had very delicate estuaries and bays that were so important to the life of aquatic critters. And, uh, and yet this fight continued on until, hallelujah, about four years ago when suddenly 
a bunch of our Republican colleagues in the Florida delegation started embracing keeping oil rigs off of the coast of Florida only about four years ago. And so maybe this is what's going to happen now with climate change. And I think it is. Uh, these major changes in uh, political approach to something as significant as the warming of the planet don't happen overnight and they don't happen uh, on the same schedule to all people. Maybe Lindsay is an example of one of those who, who has been retarded uh, in his perspective of this, who's now uh, become enlightened. I hope uh, that's, the, uh, that's the case. But going back to this, to the earlier point we were making about uh, preemption, where a central government takes away the uh, capacity of governments that are, uh, have a smaller geographic uh, uh, reach. Uh, the, uh, one of the other benefits of not having preemption is that you let local governments determine what their essential character is and adopt programs uh, that are appropriate for that character. Uh, I remember when I was working on the book, uh, uh, Intelligence Matters, I was meeting with some uh, of the officials from Scotland Yard, and I asked them, how are you dealing with the issue of terrorism in the United Kingdom? And they said, we have uh, several different approaches, depending on what the circumstances are. If it's a community that has a large number of relatively new, younger persons from the Middle East, uh, we are much more law enforcement oriented because they haven't been here long enough to understand uh, our essential culture. Conversely, if it's a community that has uh, older, particularly religiously oriented people who are considered to be and are seen by uh, their uh, parishioners uh, as thoughtful people, uh, we take a much softer approach because we think that the better course is to try to influence those few leaders rather than put a blanket on the whole population. So th that kind of understanding wh what your community's essential makeup is and how you go about influencing it and then applying policies that are appropriate to that composition, I think is the uh, a very fundamental and important lesson to learn and apply. Uh, just another example on climate change, uh, piggybacking on Bob's emphasis on local government. It is the local governments of Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach that are having to deal with the daily effects of climate change. And uh, for example, the city of Miami Beach has had to spend millions of dollars on pumps because of the rise of the sea level and at uh, mean high tide, uh, otherwise their streets would be inundated uh, with seawater sloshing over the curbs. And, uh, and so there is an example where the local government has in fact taken the lead uh, on a phenomenon that is occurring. All right, well, we have gone well past, we are 30 minutes past our allotted time. Uh, Judy, do you want to be the cleanup hitter?
I just want to thank you both so very much for this and for taking a little bit of extra time to take some questions. It's been a wonderful program and a delight to have you both here with us. So thank you so much.